Well, we're still in the book of Ezekiel. We've been in Ezekiel for a few weeks now, and we're kind of in a tough part of the book because the book is uh, where God is addressing his sinful people. They've been in sin for a very long time. As a matter of fact, Ezekiel has shown them they've been in sin for 390 years, right? And that's, that's, that's older than the United States, you know, just, it's just years and years and years of rebellion. And the Lord has come and has... Uh, said to them, uh, you're going to have to give an account for your sins. I, I will be bringing uh, discipline to you because of your sins. So that's uh, what we're in the middle of, and we're studying this book together to see uh, how we can learn uh, uh, to walk faithfully to the Lord, to the Lord uh, by looking at this text. So uh, Ezekiel now is with exile some 700 miles away from Jerusalem, but the message he's bringing is uh, Jerusalem and people in Jerusalem, uh, it's not going to go well for you. Uh, the Lord will hand you over to your enemies. Your enemies will come in and they will take your city. Uh, they will burn your houses and they will uh, put many of you to the sword. And then some of you will go off into exile. And so this is a hard word uh, because um, it is severe, isn't it? And this speaks a bit about the way the Lord, though he had dealt patiently with them, right? He waited 390 years. He had dealt patiently with them, but eventually the Lord says, okay, you'll have to give an account for your sins here. And the Lord means to come in and uh, not let them keep the home that he gave them, right? And he will, he will make them suffer, as it were, uh, the consequences of their own sin. Well, um, the people, though, don't seem to believe it. Uh, they, don't, they don't seem to think that God is really going to bring judgment. They, they're, they're in sin. Isn't it interesting? They're in sin, and they don't think that they're in sin. And actually, the funny thing, I mean, I couldn't help, as I was thinking through this, I don't want to make total parallels between Israel and, and America, but I just think that's, what, that's where we live. We, we live in a society in which people are living in sin, and, and they don't see it. And we're not immune to that. Uh, sometimes we sin, and we don't see our own sin. But, but, but on, a, on a great level... Uh, we see even in our own society, many people just rejecting the Lord, not really even knowing what the Lord's word says. And, and, and if somebody said, you know, you're living in sin, they would say, what are you talking about? We're not as bad as so-and-so. And so, but that's what was going on in Israel, right? And the reason they thought they were okay, the best we can tell, the reason they thought they were okay is because they didn't really know God's word. And so I just want to start this uh, sermon by saying uh, the best thing that's going to help us avoid a similar sort of a scenario, is to be the folks who actually know the Word of God, right? You, you have to know the Word of God. If you don't know the Word of God, you, you can make a guess that you're standing where God is. You know, maybe you grew up in church, and maybe you, you, you've been to church years ago, and so, you know, with Bible closed or Bible getting dusty on the shelf, you decide, I'm pretty sure, you know, I was raised, you know, in a church, you know, I'm pretty sure I know what God wants and doesn't want. Well, I mean... <laughs> Don't assume that. Uh, the Lord's instruction for his own people is not just to have received the word and just sort of keep it safely locked up. Uh, we are the people who receive the word and keep it before our eyes, right? Talk about it daily. Uh, read it daily. And so let me read a, a, a few verses from the Bible that points in this direction. First from the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. So there's a lot in there, isn't there? Right? Fear him, know him. Right? Serve him with all your heart. Right? Keep the commandments. So he, he's given us his word, not just so we know the commandments, but so we do them. Right? But again, we're forgetful people. So we need to keep going back and rereading it so we remember what the words are. You may remember today, and in a week's time you've already forgotten, and sometimes we don't even take a week to forget. Right? And so we just need the regular reminders of God and his word. So next we would say from Deuteronomy 6, now 4 through 9, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, right? teach to your children, right? And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, when you rise. That's just a way of saying all day long, right? When you lay them down to bed, when you wake up in the morning, when you're going for a walk, when you're just sitting at the house, right? Just in every possible, every time would be an appropriate time to talk about the Lord and his word, right? 
You shall bind them as signs on your hand, and uh, they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. So again, you can see the word of God was supposed to be central to the people, and they were supposed to talk about it a lot and, and look at it a lot, right? And so this is the way the Lord had taught uh, the people uh, to uh, treasure his word and walk in obedience to it. And that is a far cry from where we find the people in Ezekiel's day. Right? The, the, the word of God is not known to them. When somebody says, you know, you're not living God's word, they're like, I'm pretty sure from what I remember from way back when that we're doing fine. But the Lord is saying, no, actually, you're not doing fine. Uh, you are living in, in ways that are an abomination to me. Right? So the Lord is, is rightly angry and uh, the, the people uh, are culpable for their sin. Now, this idea that, that we uh, keep the Lord's word before us is not just an Old Testament concept. Certainly in the New Testament, uh, there's a similar uh, emphasis on loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. That word shows up again from Jesus' mouth uh, as the greatest commandment. Uh, Jesus also says in John 14, 21, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. So how do we know that we are the type of people that love the Lord? Well, because we're the type of people who... Uh, have the commandments of God and keep them. So again, uh, we don't get saved by keeping the commandments. We get saved by coming to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. He takes out our heart of rebellion and gives us a heart that wants to walk in his ways, right? So that, that's how you get saved, right? Go to Jesus, get forgiveness of sins, get a new heart, right? And now that you have a new heart, what are you supposed to do with it? Do whatever you want? No, not really. Uh, keep the, have the commandments of God and keep them. And again, we're just reminded, so, so you should keep reading them so you remember what they are. And so again, we don't earn our salvation by being good enough. And yet those who are trusting in Jesus, knowing we're not good enough, who are trusting in Jesus, still spend their whole life knowing God's word and doing it. Right? And so this is relevant to us today. And so for the next uh, bit here, we're going to have to um, see what happens when you neglect God's word. Uh, but, but before we get there, just one last encouragement here. I want us to commit to, uh, as we gather and read, you know, like right now we came here and, and I'm, I'm preaching uh, the Bible to you, right? Are, are we committing right now to hear, uh, understand what it says and obey? Are, are we doing that? Is that how we gathered? And I suggest that's exactly what the Lord wants us to do. You, you should come here saying, I don't know what God's going to tell us today from the Bible, but whatever God tells us from the Bible, we're going to believe it. Uh, we're going to do it. We're going to ask for his help to do it, but that's, that's what we've gathered for. And if you just come here for a good story or just to feel good about yourself, you're missing the point here. Uh, the Lord has you here so that you can know what he wants you to do, so that you can ask for his help. You can even confess where you haven't done it, right? The Lord wants me to do this. I haven't been doing it. Let me confess that. Let me trust in Jesus to forgive me for that. And now let me, by his help, commit to walk in obedience to his word. That's why we gather. That's how you come, should come to church. That's how we should be gathering week by week. And yet, we need to know that you need God's word more than just on a Sunday. Just once a week, you know. Uh, remember that passage, as you walk by the way, as you lie down, as you rise up. You need it in your own home. Read the word in your own home. Read it with your family. Right? And so... Uh, we we want to commit to having God's word uh, in our lives, uh, in our families, teaching it to our children. And, and these are ways that we are, by God's help, kept from the type of rebellion that God's people got into. Right? So uh, this, this is just all preliminary. We need to get into this text. We've got several chapters, and I cannot uh, just tell you everything in the chapters. I'm going to tell you a few things from some of the chapters. And then that's the best we can do today. So the Lord is saying that he's bringing judgment on his people. And uh, he's going he's gonna to talk about uh, the sins of Israel from chapter 12 through 24. So that's this week's sermon and next week's sermon. So we're just going to do it half of it today or so. Uh, in chapter 12, one point, I'm not going to tell you everything in chapter 12. Again, you can just read this, but you, you're going to be amazed at uh, the sins of the people. And I, I think one of the most difficult chapters is chapter 16, which we won't go into all the details, but it speaks about just the sin of uh, God's people there. But chapter 12 then speaks a little bit about the hardening effect of sin. Did you know that sin hardens you? Like, like if you hear God's word and you say, I'm not going to do it, after a little while, you don't care that you don't do it. Have you ever experienced that? Right? Like, like you used to feel guilty about certain things, and now you don't. 
right? You used to feel guilty. I used to come to church, and then I stopped coming, and I used to kind of feel bad about that, and now I don't feel bad about that at all, right? And you're just like, okay, well, that, the, the Bible actually said that would happen. The, the, Bible, the Bible told you <laughs> you would become hardened if you just kept going off in sin, right? And, and one of the things that's going on here is that uh, God's people were supposed to be faithful to God and remember that they were worshiping. They were in the place where they're supposed to be worshiping God. They also worshiped the gods of the nations, right? And so, and God, by the way, here we're, we're very jealous to only worship the Lord here, and we would not worship anyone else here. But, but it had gotten to such a point in Israel that they would, in the place where they were supposed to worship God, worship false gods. And the Lord was very angry about that. Right, and one of the things about the false gods is the false gods are sort of like well they were they were they were images right uh, they were made out of precious metals let's say made out of gold or silver or something like that and you know they, they remember just think about the, the the golden calf right that was kind of fashioned after the false gods of the nations well I mean if something's made out of gold you may know, you may or may not know this about gold but it can't hear like even if you had ears on it it couldn't hear and even if you like made it into sort of like uh, sort of having a mouth it wouldn't actually speak. Right? And, and if it had eyes, it couldn't actually see. Right? And so the Lord then says to these people, you are kind of becoming like the gods that you're worshiping. Uh, because he says in verse uh, 1 and 2, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, you dwell in the midst of a rebellious house who have eyes to see but, but see not, who have ears to hear but hear not, for they are a rebellious house. What the Lord ends up doing is making us like what we worship. Uh, this is a concept we could spend a long time about, but I'm just going to lay it out there for you. At least here, right? They are worshiping a God that cannot see or hear. And in time, when God speaks, they don't, they don't see what God is doing and they don't hear God's word. Right? And that's the danger of us deciding to not be faithful to the Lord himself or the, to the Lord alone and to try to go out and live like the world around us. We will in time become like them who also don't listen to the Lord. Who also don't see what the Lord is doing in this world. And so uh, we see, though, that the Lord then, and I have to be brief about this, the Lord just basically says, because you're like that, and because you're living uh, in disobedience, I am going to scatter you. And so the message in this is sort of a message we've seen earlier, which is basically the Lord is going to take some other country, right? So Israel is here, and they're going to bring Babylon in to sort of take them off into captivity. And what the Lord doesn't want the people to think is that you know, this is all Babylon's fault. Or, the, you know, Babylon was so powerful that God couldn't protect them. The Lord does not want them to think that. The Lord wants them to think, I'm powerful enough to keep Babylon away forever. And yet because of your sin, Babylon will be coming in. And when they come in and take you off, it's my doing, God says, <laughs> right? I'm the one who let them come. I'm the one who wants them to teach you a lesson. And so the Lord says in verse 14, I will scatter toward every wind, Right? I will unsheathe the sword after them, and then they will know that I am the Lord. And this, by the way, is a very, it should be a very troubling thing to these people. See, way back when, when, you know, when, the, when the Lord had brought them out of, uh, out of Egypt and, and given them the, 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 his word on Mount Sinai, he showed that he was with them. And how did they know that he was the Lord? Well, because he was the Lord who who carried them on eagles' wings, right? Like, they knew the Lord was the Lord because he had blessed them incredibly, beyond what they could ever hope for, right? And that's how God let them know that he was the Lord. I am all-powerful because I can give you amazing things. And now the Lord says, I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to show you that I am the Lord, and here's how I'm going to do it. And instead of showing you that I am the Lord by giving you great blessing, because you've been so rebellious, I'm going to show you that I am the Lord, by making you suffer the consequences of your sin. I'm going to hand you over to your enemies. And when I hand you over to your enemies, then you will know that I am the Lord. And that, again, you, you don't want that side of the Lord, do you? And so the Lord is warning us through, through his warning to Israel. Right? The, the, Lord is, the Lord is the Lord. And if we will walk in obedience, we will know blessing beyond what we deserve. But if we choose to walk in disobedience, just don't assume, well, I grew up in church, everything will be fine. No. If you commit yourselves to just sort of have a deaf ear to all of God's word, you can expect for God to show you that he is God by bringing 
difficulties, trials, troubles, and sometimes outright disaster. And he's showing you there in his discipline that he is the Lord. Well, chapter 13, we need to keep moving here, don't we? Um, there, there are many people, many prophets in, um, in Jerusalem at this time who were speaking. And they were speaking, and the big problem of what they were doing was they were speaking whatever idea popped into their head instead of just delivering the Lord's word, right? Now, by the way, you need to watch out for that, right? Uh, I'm not supposed to be up here just giving you whatever idea pops into my head, right? You, you don't need that. I mean, I, I might talk about you know, different things, you know, when we walk through the hallway or on a Tuesday afternoon. But when I come up here, I'm here to give you God's word. And if I'm not giving you God's word, you should just, you know, find somebody else who will, right? Because this is, uh, this is, we need to hear from the Lord. So I'm trying to limit myself to just, this is what the Lord says, right? And, and, but what they had were some prophets who thought they, they just had these feelings, right? I mean, some people are saying judgment's coming, Right? And they're like, I just have this feeling that everything's fine. And that's what they said. Right? They're looking at sinful Jerusalem. They're hearing some other prophets say, uh, God is going to destroy Jerusalem. And they're like, yeah, I, I think peace. I think you should just go ahead and start building, actually, because everything's going to be fine. Right? And what, what, what Ezekiel says about them is they have not heard from the Lord. These people have not heard from the Lord. Look. And, and so he knows that he has heard from the Lord and he's speaking God's truth to them. But, you know, some well-meaning people even today do that, don't they? They say, oh, there's no trouble here. Just keep on doing what you're doing, right? All these people who talk about hellfire and brimstone, that's terrible, you know? I mean, you know, we're just, every, everything's, we're just all going to get along here. And, and again, I'm, I'm not denying that some people might overdo certain things, but at, at the end of the day, uh, as, as well-meaning as someone might be, they're not doing you any service to sort of, keep talking to you in a way in which you just keep feeling comfortable in your sin. Anybody who talks to you and you know that you're, you, you have some conviction of sin or had some conviction of sin and you're feeling kind of like, you know, I know the Lord probably wants me to change about that. And they just come to you and say, oh, keep it up. Nothing bad will happen. Like they're not your friend. And as a matter of fact, they're not only not your friend, they are the enemy of the Lord. And so that was what was going on there. Um, they were speaking whatever was in their mind. I, I can read briefly here, verses 1 through 3. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel, who are prophesying and say to those who prophesy from their own hearts, hear the word of the Lord. And thus says the Lord God, woe to the foolish prophets who follow their own spirit and have seen nothing, right? They're following whatever impulse they have in their mind. They haven't seen anything. They say they've heard from me. They have not heard from me. And so the Lord, in time, uh, will with those prophets in particular, he will say, I will give them no true word, which is 9 and 10. He, that's the Lord basically saying, uh, these people, if they've ever heard anything from me, if they're going to keep saying words that don't come from me, those prophets will never hear a word from me. Right? And some people, by the way, you know, got into business uh, as a, a TV preacher or something, whatever else, and they just keep on thinking that they've got the whatever, and they keep saying that they're speaking for the Lord, and they are getting no word from the Lord. Right? Just, just compare right? They're claiming that they're hearing from the Holy Spirit, but it, the Holy Spirit inspired this word. So if what they say contradicts, if what they claim the Spirit says here contradicts what the Holy Spirit said here, that's the lie, isn't it? And so we judge things, maybe a little encouragement to be Berean here, right? Like study the scriptures and see if these things are true. But don't just believe everybody who gets up on TV and says, you know, I got this or I got that. And that's a bit what's going on here. There's a, there's a, a bit about the, the that mention of barley, uh, and, and you, you, they, they, they were trying to get, barley doesn't sound like we'd get very far today. Uh, today people are working for more like uh, lots of money. But you get the idea, they were, they were prophesying to make a profit uh, in that day, and beware of those sorts of people. And so um, the Lord basically then again threatens that he will, he will act in anger. He's angry at such things. Well, we need to keep moving along, verse uh, chapter 14 now, briefly. Chapter 14 um, it says um, that, the, that these false prophets, again, um, will not, um, we're supposed to call people to turn, to turn from their sins. Look at, um, look at chapter 14, verse 6. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols and turn 
uh, away your face from all of your abominations. And again, the Lord is threatening here uh, that what, what the prophets are supposed to be saying is not peace and peace and there is, we, when there is no peace. Uh, what the prophets are supposed to be saying is you're in sin and turn from your sin. And so again, I, I'm willing to, to uh, think that some people overdo it. How do they overdo it uh, today, perhaps? Well, perhaps they're legalists and they've made it more rules than even God has, right? I, I can agree that that sometimes can happen. Uh, but the mere idea that someone is saying that there's sin out there, uh, you, you just in a fallen world, you have to say, of course there is. <laughs> and, and if they say there's sin in your own life, even for me as a pastor, I'm saying, of course there is. I mean, not that I want there to be sin, but I, I'm, not, I'm not going to heaven because I stopped sinning. And neither, neither are you, right? So, so if, if, if people are like, yeah, stop talking about sin. Well, the Lord means for us to walk in obedience to him. And when we're not, that's called sin. And that sin needs to be shown to us that we could be thankful that we were. I mean, it's painful, right? I mean, you, nobody loves to be shown their sin. But there's a sense in which we, we, we find it necessary, we find it helpful. Because we want to walk in the Lord's ways. And sometimes we're blind to the sin that we're in. But again, so the Lord graciously uses someone addressing us in our sins, calling us to repent. And if the Lord is working in our heart at that time, we, we repent of our sin. Uh, we turn to the Lord. We begin to trust Jesus, like we said before. And then we just say, Lord, help me to live differently. And again, the problem uh, for the people is that they were uh, not listening to the Lord. Uh, and they were not repenting of their sins. And, and the false prophets were not calling the people to repentance. And the people were... Uh, not well, well served by this. Well, uh, I need to sum up what's going on in this section before we move to chapter 16. Uh, what we see here is the Lord is building his case that you just have to go back. We, we talked about the, the judgment that's going to come. It's going to be terrible, but the Lord is building his case that the people deserve the judgment that's coming. Uh, so the Lord is showing them about how bad everything is. Not only are the people bad, even their prophets are bad, right? And the Lord says, you guys are, so, you know, 390 years of disobedience. You know, it's, it's all come to this, and I'm going to bring judgment upon you. And it will be terrible. It'll be worse than anything you can really almost hardly imagine. And yet it will, be, as a matter of fact, be not overdoing it, but exactly uh, what uh, the people deserve for their sins. And if anything, the Lord has been patient upon patient upon patient to wait 390 years, but now the time of reckoning has come. And so that, that section ends here in chapter 14, verse 23. You shall know uh, that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, declares the Lord God. Right? The Lord is basically saying, you, you, when I bring the judgment, you won't think, well, he, there was just no reason why God should do this. No, no, no. He laid out the case. There's, there's plenty of cause. Cause upon cause for the Lord to bring this judgment. Well, um, what I, again, can't help but think, of, think today is that um, many around us are rejecting the Lord and, reject, and do, do not know the Lord's word. And I kind of want to end this section the way I began it. Like, let us be the people that know God's word and are familiar with it and interact with it, right? And, and let us reject the culture that's rejecting Jesus, Right? Let's not think, you know, oh, this was just a problem for them way back then. No, it's a problem for us today. Some, some of us are tempted to not walk in the Lord's ways and to walk in the ways that everybody around us walks. And the Lord is trying to get our attention today and say, if you just keep living that way, you will, the, the Lord is being patient right now, right? But, but a day of reckoning will come. And, 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 and then you might think, well, I'm, I'm in despair. But the, but the Lord has good news for us, doesn't he? Right? He, he sent his son. And we'll get to that maybe a, a bit at the end. But, but, but the Lord has an answer for us, a help for us. Well, chapter 16 then, and this is one of those, this is one of those chapters, literally, I mean, I read a few commentaries this week, and all of them said, this is the kind of chapter you don't read with the kids. Isn't that funny? Like, you're not supposed to read this chapter of the Bible with the kids? But it's pretty, it's pretty graphic. As a matter of fact, the best we can tell, even the Bible translators themselves sort of like do their best to sort of tame it down. So that if you read it in the original Hebrew, you would think, you would, you would get, uh, as it were, a few more insights into what Ezekiel's really trying to say about the sin of the people here. And uh, I don't know if I'm inspiring anybody to learn Hebrew so they can learn all the details, but that is exactly uh, what's going on there. The people's sin is terrible. And uh, the Lord, again, has just cause for uh, the way that he is uh, bringing judgment on them. So let me try to walk us through this text, but not read every bit of it. I, I will read the first uh, three verses here. Again, 
uh, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, make known to Jerusalem her abominations, and say, Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, your, sin, or your origin and your birth are of the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. Again, I can't even explain all of that, but I will say, I want to point out to the word abomination. What does abomination mean? Well, that's like the strongest Hebrew word that can tell you that the Lord doesn't like what you're up to, right? The, the Lord couldn't use a stronger word than abomination. So whether or not you use that as a very strong word, the Lord is using it and saying, I, can, I cannot be any clearer. Uh, I am very uh, displeased with all that you are up to, right? And the problem that they have um, is... They probably thought of themselves, at least part of what they thought, they probably thought of themselves as pretty good people. And by the way, again, I just keep seeing parallels to sort of like people who grew up in church around here, right? We all like to think of ourselves as pretty good people, right? And the Lord is looking at his own people in the Bible, right? The Israelites. And he's looking at them and they're like, I, I know you guys try to think of yourselves as really great people, and uh, you're really not. Uh, I, I chose you of all the peoples of the, of the earth to make a, a great nation of you, but it's not because you were great. And so that's what the Lord is trying to say. And so the way the Lord explains it is, the Lord in verses 3 through 5, he says, you're kind of like a baby that is born. And I don't know if you, anybody's been there for, the, uh, for when a baby's born, but they're, kinda, they, they're covered with, you know, let's just say gunk or something. You know, they're, they're covered, right? And, and then in that day, if somebody didn't want a baby... That baby would be born and literally not cleaned off and just set outside on a, just in the garbage dump and left, right? That, that, that's, that's, the, you know, that's, that's the way some would do it, right? Not, I mean, this is not the Christian way, right? But the, that's what would happen. And the Lord basically says, I found you guys just like that, just covered in gunk. No, nobody, nobody clothed you. Nobody cleaned you up. They just set you outside. That's how I found you. So, so the Lord is does not agree with Israel that they are really great people. And no wonder God picked us because we're really great, right? The Lord says, look, I, I just found you like covered in gook and on a pile ready to die. That's how I found you. And then he says in verses uh, 4 through 6, uh, so they were again, naked out left to, to die. That's how the Lord found them. And now verses uh, 6 through 14, now it speaks of they sort of reach the age of maturity and yet still they are needy. The Lord, again, still, still uses the word, I found you naked, right? But, but now they're a bit older, but they're still in need. And the Lord says, I found you there, and you needed help. And, and again, but he's trying to build the case. This is not somebody awesome. And the Lord says, there's somebody awesome. I should love them. It's like somebody who like, is the most desperate of the desperate. And that's how, that's, how the Lord, that's how we found you, the Lord says to Israel, right? And for no good reason, I set my love on you. I cleaned you up. I gave you rings, I gave you food, I gave you great clothing. As a matter of fact, I married you. And since God is king, I made you a queen. That's what the Lord says. So, so again, just imagine someone you know, saved from the heap and, and vulnerable out there and ready to be taken advantage of. And the Lord comes in and doesn't even just do something nice, you know, give somebody some money to take care of them. No, he, he sets his love on them and gets into a covenant relationship with them and says, I will be faithful to you. That's how, that's how the Lord saved Israel. And honestly, you should begin to think of your own salvation in this way. You weren't you were awesome. I mean, I, I know we like to think highly of ourselves, but, but the, Lord, the Lord knows our need. And the Lord has come into our life and brought us salvation, though we don't deserve it. Well, again, uh, that's, maybe we'll get to that a little bit more later. But the Lord is basically saying, he, he spreads his garment over them, which is sort of like, uh, from the book of Ruth, what Boaz does there. But just sort of like, this is, this is marriage language. Uh, the Lord enters a covenant with them, uh, verse 8. And it's interesting, just think about this. Just to get clarity on probably what Ezekiel's point is, let's just look at how the Lord speaks in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Picking up in verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any of the other peoples that the Lord has set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping his oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery and from the hand of Pharaoh 
and the king of Egypt. So again, the Lord was there saying it wasn't because you were the most in numbers, because you were uh, few in number. As a matter of fact, another text that I kind of cut out for the sake of time basically says, uh, I chose you not because you were uh, the most obedient. You were stubborn, <laughs> right? And if you just look at the Old Testament, you can see how stubborn they were, right? So I didn't choose you because you were the most obedient people. You are stiff-necked people, right? And so the Lord is looking again at us, just think of us, right? And saying, I didn't save you because you were so good. I saved you because you're so bad. You were desperately in need of help. And I, for no good reason, <laughs> except I set my love on you, am going to save you. I'm going to make you my own people. I'm going to make you, again, my, my bride, the Lord says. And so by grace, the Lord chose them and made them his bride and he made them his bride, though, in order that they would be faithful to him, right? So you don't, you don't, like, find somebody who's unworthy. A king doesn't find somebody who's unworthy. Make that person his bride and then say, I don't care if you're unfaithful. No. <laughs> he, he means for this bride to be faithful. And again, that's what the Lord means for us as well. Well, unfaithfully, the, uh, the people were unfaithful to the Lord religiously, verses 16 through 24. Uh, again, the Lord took his gold and his silver... Uh, the, the Lord had given them gold and silver. What did the people do? They took that gold and silver and they used the gold and silver. That the, so imagine again, his bride, he says, here's gold and silver for you, uh, sweet wife. And she takes that gold and silver and she goes and is unfaithful to the Lord with it. Right? So it's just such an affront to the Lord. I've given you these wonderful things that you can enjoy being my bride, the Lord says. And they're like, yeah, I'll just, I'll take that. I, I, I don't think anything of you. I, I'm going to take the gold and silver and go have other relations. Be unfaithful, the Lord says. And so uh, verse 20 says this, and you took your sons and your daughters whom you had born to me. So again, the Lord gave them children. And th those children had been born really for the Lord. We're supposed to raise our children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. They had taken those children and literally sacrificed them to false gods. And these you sacrifice to them to be devoured. Literally child sacrifices going on among Israel. Again, they didn't remember. Their, the Lord is basically saying, don't you remember what you were like when you were a kid? <laughs> Needy, dirty, desperate. Nothing beautiful about you, and yet I set my love on you and, and blessed. And so the Lord is angry, rightly angry. They're also uh, unfaithful to the Lord politically, 23 through 34. Again, very strong words in this section. This is, again, a section, you, if you spend some time, you can just see how, how angry the Lord is about this. Uh, and, and the people uh, went after other nations, after other gods. And the Lord compares his people, not just to an unfaithful wife. So that's like one, that's one level of betrayal, right? If, if, you, if you're a husband and your wife just basically finds some other person... That's a level of betrayal that is, you know, very unpleasant. But the Lord doesn't say, well, you're just unfaithful. He says, no, you're, you're, Israel was a full-out prostitute. All right, so this is just like unfaithfulness upon unfaithfulness, unfaithfulness several times a day, unfaithfulness every single day, right? That's what the Lord is saying about how far, how unfaithful Israel has been. And again, this is the Lord talking, so the Lord uses prostitute language to talk about how unfaithful Israel was. And the thing about, uh, he even says, and there's a difference though, by the way, they were, they were as it were, you know, not, they weren't just a prostitute. They were like worse than the average prostitute. See, because what does the average prostitute do? Well, the average prostitute, uh, when she uh, goes out and she is unfaithful, she gets some money, right? Like at least she's getting paid for it, right? And the Lord says, actually, you guys are different. Because not only do you not take money in your prostitution, you give money. Like you're the, op you're the worst prostitute there is. You're the, you're the despicable of despicables, right? And so the Lord, and you might say, I don't like this kind of language. This is really kind of rough. Well, again, this is how the Lord thinks of our unfaithfulness to him. Anyone who would be unfaithful to the Lord, the Lord is not mincing words. He's trying to say it's ugly, and it's probably uglier than you ever thought. And you liked, you're you probably in your sin comfortable because you think your sin is not that big of a deal. And the Lord is here grabbing your attention to say your sin is way uglier in your sight, in his sight, than it is in your sight. And the person out of touch is not God who's overdoing it, but you who are blind to your own sin. And so the Lord then says that he will pronounce judgment on them, 35 through 43. The Lord will gather Israel's lovers around. 
right? So he's been, they've been unfaithful. I'm going to gather all your lovers around, and I'm going to, as it were, shame you before them. That's what the Lord is going to do, right? They were supposed to be faithful to the Lord, and so now the Lord says, I'm going to, I'm going to expose you to them. And again, this is the Lord's just judgment uh, for them for their sins. And he again speaks about the, the judgment that's going to come. The, the Lord at the end here, or toward, toward the end, is saying the people did not deserve his grace, verses 44 through 52. Right? And even though they never had earned God's grace, basically the Lord is saying, you're not going to get to enjoy it anymore. I, I've let you enjoy my grace, and I'm not going to let you enjoy my grace anymore. Right? And, and even, and remember, I don't know if you think of like, you know, top list of worst uh, cities. If, if you tried to think of top list of worst cities in the Bible, probably up there would be Sodom and Gomorrah, right? I mean, they, you know, great wickedness destroyed by fire, right? It was a, that's a pretty big one, right? And, and the Lord in this section then says, actually, you know Sodom and Gomorrah? So, Sodom, she's your sister. You're actually worse than your sister. <laughs> You're worse than Sodom, Right? And then he says this in verse, uh, he says that in 49. But again, in verse 52, listen to this. Because of your sins in which you acted more abominably than they, they are more right, they are more in the right than you. Like Sodom is more righteous than you. And again, the Lord is building his case to just say, you guys are completely and utterly in wickedness. And the Lord is right to bring justice. And so when we get to the end of this section, um, we just need to remember the reason this is so bad is because the Lord had saved them to be faithful to him, right? He, he, he made them his wife so that they would be faith just for him alone, exclusively for him. And I just want to remind you, the Lord is the same way with us. He has saved us and he's called us not to live like everyone else around us, but to be exclusively for him, our heart for the Lord, loving him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Again, Deuteronomy 7, 9, and 10. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. <laughs> the Lord is calling us to love him and keep his commandments. And he means to be faithful. And so what a wonderful call the Lord has made to our lives. And then again, on the other side, what a great wickedness it was for the people to be so... Um, so much rejecting the Lord. So the, the very end, you think this is going to end with just like, you know, an atomic bomb or something like that because the Lord's already laid out all of the wickedness there. And yet this chapter ends in perhaps an unexpected way, especially now verses 59 through 63. For thus says the Lord God, I will deal with you as you have done, you who have despised the oath in breaking the covenant, yet... I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish for you an everlasting covenant. So, so the Lord is in the middle of basically saying, most of you will be uh, you know, punished, se severely punished, right? And you'd, you'd think, well, he has the right to just sort of wipe us all off the face of the earth. And the Lord basically says, well, I will... More or less do that, except I will save some. <laughs> I will not forget that I said through you all the families of the earth will be blessed. I will not forget that basically I said through you I will bring one who will bless all the nations. So he's going to save a remnant, isn't he? He's going to make an everlasting covenant with some. He's going to save them out and through that preserve the line through which David and then finally through David, through Jesus Christ will ultimately come because though the people were in rebellion, uh, the Lord will punish those in rebellion and yet he will still have grace on some. And we remember the words of Psalm 103, verse 8, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. See, we see then that the Lord, we're reminded here at the end of this passage that the Lord, even in the midst of his wrath, remembers mercy. See, one of the things that keeps happening in this chapter, in chapter 16, verse 22 and verse 43 and other places, the Lord basically says, you kept forgetting me. You kept forgetting. And then don't we see preciously in the verse we just read that the Lord said, well, you have, forgot, you have forgotten. But verse 60 says, yeah, I will remember. Right? It, it, that's the contrast between us and the Lord, isn't it? We are unfaithful. He is faithful. We keep forgetting. He remembers. What a blessed thing uh, that he 
uh, makes up for all of our sins. He, he is the opposite of us. And he, as it were, as our substitute, comes in to save us. Though we, have, we don't deserve it. And though we deserve, as it were, his punishment. And yet the Lord, the Lord knows all about it. And he's not mincing words. He says, he's not saying to you, you're really not that bad. No, he's saying you're, you're that bad and you're worse than you even know. And yet... I've set my love on you. And yet, I will forgive your sins. He says in verse 62, I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth again because of your shame when I atone for you for all that you have done, declares the Lord. Atonement. That's exactly what the Lord Jesus came into the world to do, to be the propitiation for our sins, to live the perfect life we should have lived and suffer the punishment we deserve. And in his work on the cross through death and resurrection, he has atoned for our sins, right? So the Lord basically says you're terribly bad, worse than you even realize, and you deserve terrible punishment, and I will send my son to bear that punishment for you. And so the Lord sends Jesus Christ into the world who does, in fact, is the fulfillment of this promise, right? I will atone for you. Who comes in and, and washes away our sins. And everyone who trusts in God or receives Jesus Christ by faith will have their sins forgiven, will be given the new heart, will be part of the new covenant community. And that gospel message is held out to you today. Some of you today are already trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and some of you perhaps are not. And again, this has not been one of those happy messages that you're just, you're just about this, you're pretty good, but you're just about this far away from, you know, pushing you over to the edge and you'll finally be good enough. No, you're so far away. We're all so far away. But if we can embrace that we're so far away and that's still no hindrance because Jesus paid it all, if we can trust in just Jesus, well, then your sins can be forgiven. And so we hold out to you at the end of this sermon, a, a sermon that honestly is more discouragement than I normally like to talk about on a Sunday morning. But the text pushed us to this, didn't it? I, I want to hold out to you the grace of Jesus Christ and, and the promise of forgiveness of sins on the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Every Sunday we want to have the gospel in the sermon because that's our only hope. So every week we remember the gospel of Jesus Christ just as we did right now. Today, we, we got the joy of remembering what Christ has done when we saw Jack baptized, remembering through baptism, through, through death and resurrection that his sins were washed away. Once a month, we meet together and we observe the Lord's Supper because Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And we remember our past being so, we, we were the forgetful sorts and Jesus was the remembering one. And now we say, Lord, help me to be a remembering one too. Not that I would earn my salvation, but I want to remember what you have done to save us. And so praise the Lord for so many opportunities for us to be pointed again and again to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And let's I pray the Lord would not only bring the gospel savingly to our hearts, but put it always in our memory that we might remember Christ, our only hope. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, for a morning where we can gather and hear your word and hear the sinfulness of sin, uh, the just judgment that we deserve outside of Christ, uh, the hope that Christ is our only hope, Savior, and the truth that he has atoned. And because of what Christ has done, our sins can be forgiven. And so we pray, Lord God, today that any who are not trusting in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins will trust in him today. And that we will rejoice in the salvation in Christ Jesus. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>